Painting wildlife, especially painting big cats, can be incredibly tricky. Their form, expression, pattern, and texture always manage to keep us on our toes, and not to mention trying to mix the perfect color for their complex fur color palettes. If you're finding yourself getting frustrated, or maybe you're wanting to tackle painting a big cat for the first time, let's take a step back and get back to the basics. We're going to tackle this tiger painting together in grayscale with just a splash of color. It's simple, yet at the end of this tutorial, you will be equipped with techniques and tips and tricks that will translate over to painting in color. Let's get started. First, I have listed all of the colors and brushes that I have used throughout today's painting. Now, you do not have to use all of the supplies I have mentioned, so feel free to adjust them accordingly to your own taste and style. As for the first step in our painting, we're going to go ahead and get started on the background of this piece. I want to start with the background first, as with acrylic we are going to layer everything on top of the furthest away layer, and in this case that will be our backdrop. So for the background color mixture, I have mixed Mars Black, Titanium White, Mixing White for a little bit of added bulk and quantity of paint, and then a little bit of Burnt Umber to give the mix a slighter, warmer tone. Here I am using a large sponge brush, and I actually picked this brush up from their dollar store. It came in a value pack, and I wanted to experiment to see whether or not I would like this style of large coverage for the background of my painting. So along with you, I am learning and experimenting as well. I have chosen a sponge brush that had a tapered edge for a little bit more precision and control. I was worried that I would not be able to control this brush at all, and in some areas I went a little wayward, but for the most part I was able to keep it under control. And for the first layer of paint with a very soakable brush, the coverage on the background wasn't terrible. Um, it definitely will need a few more coats, but overall I was happy with the sort of feel and the coverage I was able to obtain. Now something to note as well, if you do not have a sponge brush available and you do not want to hop up right now and go and get one, a large filbert, square, or a round brush will do the job wonderfully as well. So feel free to change this brush out for a brush you enjoy working with and you know works for you and your background work. Once that initial background layer has dried, I'm going to go ahead and add in some visual elements to this background to keep it from being a little stagnant or even a little bit boring. I'm using the same sponge brush as before, but adding in more titanium white to my color mixture, and I'm going to selectively place some brush marks and blending to create a little bit of a highlight around the tiger's face. Now the goal for my blending is to create a bit of an ombre or a smoky look with the top of the paint being just a little bit more highlighted than the bottom. Now you can add in as much highlight or as little highlight as you prefer, but just keep in mind the value of the tiger that we will be adding in. We don't want to go so light that we're going to almost blend in or distract from the tiger's face later in the painting. To finish off this background now, I'm basically going to take my sponge brush and I'm going to go around the entirety of the background, filling in any areas that I see maybe didn't get enough coverage with this really dark charcoal color. And I'm essentially going to go back and forth, blending and working this background until it's the amount of highlight and low light that I'm looking for and a seamless blend. Once the background has dried, I'm going to go ahead and complete the next crucial step in this painting. Now this step will definitely set us up for success when we start to tackle the fur pattern of this tiger. I am taking my small round brush and Mars Black straight out of the tube, and I'm going to go around the entirety of this painting, blocking in all of the areas of black markings that I can see. This will include around the eye, back of the ears, the nose outline, and all of those gorgeous stripes. The process can be a little bit tedious, admittedly, but once it is completed, this is a crucial roadmap for remembering the shape, the style, and the anatomy of this tiger's face and its markings. Something I find helpful during this stage in the painting is to have my grid method photograph in my hand. So you can see here on the left, I'm holding my reference with the grid on top and a very dry brush with some black paint on it, essentially to sketch in these markings. I was having a bit of difficulty towards the middle of this tiger's head as there was a very scrunched up bit of fur there that had a lot of information in it. So a lot of folds, a lot of stripes, and so I was actually getting a little confused. So I decided the best way to tackle this was to lightly sketch in the area first and then come in with the large blocks of black paint. 
Sometimes if we jump too soon into a thick opaque paint, it can become a little bit confusing. So I always say at this stage, if you're finding yourself feeling frustrated or a little confused, less is more and start there first. As a side note while we are finishing up our black outline is to remember to use our paintbrushes to our advantage. They are all shapes and sizes for a reason and we have to use that the best that we can. For the larger areas I have switched from a small round brush to a medium sized filbert and this will give me a lot more coverage with less work but it also has a nice tapered thin edge so that the edges of those markings are nice and fluffy. Once those outlines have dried, I'm going to go ahead and start working towards building up the base layers of this tiger painting. Now today I have chosen to create this tiger in grayscale, so you can see on the left hand side of the screen I have my reference that has been converted to black and white using Lightroom by Adobe. Now you can use whatever photo editing program you prefer, or if you do not have a photo editing program, most computers nowadays and phones have some sort of photo editing application with Within them that is standard you can add a black and white filter on top of your favorite reference and you're good to go. I will start with my medium sized filbert brush and I'm going to create a dark gray glaze using Mars black, a touch of white, and a lot of water to really thin this acrylic down. Now looking at our references for a moment and comparing the two, you can see that where the orange is on the color photograph will be where the darker shades of gray will go in our grayscale painting. The same can be said about the lighter areas in the color photo, so the areas of light orange, a little bit of a light brown, and the cream white color on the chin and the underbelly, that will convert to a lighter gray color softening into a white in our grayscale. And one thing that I found helpful while I was painting this and I kind of didn't realize this after until it dawned on me was the one thing that remains the same in both paintings is that the tiger's mouth, neck, ear area, underbelly has a lot of white and no matter what color or grayscale converted this photograph stays the exact same. So we know in both instances of our paintings that white area will remain white in both paintings. Essentially, this step is just furthering our roadmap of our tiger portrait and giving us an idea of where we are going to put these values as we begin to work with more opaque acrylics. Now, some artists may skip this step, but I find having a nice base to work on, even if it's a light base, um, rather than just working on a standard white primed canvas, helps when using acrylics. My paints seem to apply way nicer and it's also a lot easier on the eyes rather than working on a stark white canvas. Put down as much of a gray base as you prefer and just work on building those layers and the placement of those gray values. The next step in our painting, once those layers have dried, is we are going to start layering some opaque paint down in the eye region of this painting. Now I like to start with the eyes as getting these to look realistic and full of meaning is so important to how our painting is connected to by a viewer. So I want to make sure that I get them just right before I spend any more time working on the fur or other aspects of this tiger. I will start with a small round brush and a small filbert interchangeably to fill in the base layers of the eye and the surrounding area. Now I've chosen for my painting to add in a splash of color within the eye, so I have mixed a color of titanium white, burnt sienna, cadmium yellow together to create a very sort of soft eggshell color, and this is going to be the only color element throughout this entire painting. I'm starting off in the surrounding area with a soft light gray and a white as a base for the fur surrounding the eye that I'm going to detail later on. Now I like to add in these base layers surrounding the eye as I'm always working from back to front. So I know with the eye there's going to be some elements that are on the closest layer to us, for example the fine details like the eyelashes or any sort of glossiness, so I want to make sure that I get those further back layers down first before I worry about detailing. While those base layers are drying, we can go ahead and start working on the details within the eye itself. Now using my small round brush, I'm going to start layering in some shadows to this eyeball. I first begin with a light peach color to kind of change some of the hues within this eye. I want it to be diverse and rich in color and not static with just one shade of yellow. So I'm going to go ahead and add burnt sienna 
a little bit more to my yellow mixture to warm it up and bring this eye to a more earthy tone. I want to slowly work my way into some oranges and browns and thought this peach was a really nice transition gradient color. With the power of movie magic, this eye has now dried and I'm going to go ahead and start layering in some shadows. Now it's important, especially with an area that is small like an eye, to really take the layering process slowly and build up these layers gradually. Each time my hand leaves the canvas, I'm adjusting the shadow color ever so slightly. So I'm adding more burnt sienna, more burnt umber, and darkening the shadow color by about 5, 10, 15% each time. You can even manage to get some really nice textures going by using a wet on wet technique, mixing the colors on the eye itself if the paint is still wet or just a little bit tacky. Something that I have found helpful when creating eyes for my portraits is to use a very small brush and a little bit of a wiggle technique by your hand. Now I know wiggle technique is probably not very technical sounding, but it's just the kind of name that I came up for this technique and something that I caught myself doing when I was learning how to paint. So looking up close at an eye, there are tons of veins, details, lines, and other spot-like features that a very calm, steady hand just won't be able to reach recreate. And so I found by wiggling my hand back and forth kind of in a little haphazard type way with a very small detailer brush, I was able to recreate some of the very interesting details within the eye that you can only really see up close to your painting. And so I think this gives your viewer something to really lean in for and to kind of soak up all the aspects of your work and find something new every time they look at your painting. So be a little bit carefree. It's okay if you go into an area you don't want it to. You can always cover it up with acrylic. You have that option. Just be a little haphazard, a little carefree with your hand. Wiggle it around a bit and you may find that you're actually creating some really cool looks and techniques that actually match your reference. The next step in our eye painting is arguably the most important, and that is to get the catchlight on the eye just right so it brings this painting to life. Our goal is to have a glossy, healthy looking eye that reflects our light source correctly. Whether you are following a reference or painting on your own today, remember to think about your light source's position. Is it above your subject? Is it in front of the subject? Or maybe the catch light is very, very light. Your light source is very bright. Or maybe your subject is in the shadows. All of these questions and information can instantly change the mood and the look of your painting. So I encourage you to have fun with it and try something new. I will start for this painting today with my small round brush and I've mixed a color combination of a very light blue gray. So I'm using Mars black, titanium white, and phthalo blue together to start off. Now I start with this color so that I can lightly map out the size and the shape of the highlight before I have to commit to its final form. Now, once I'm happy with the size and the shape of that initial blocked in highlight, what I like to do is I like to take that original light blue gray mixture and I like to add in titanium white to it. So I will lighten this color by about 10, 15, 20% every time my hand leaves the canvas or every new layer of highlight that I put in, I'm lightening it by about 10, 15%. Now I like to go as light as I can with the acrylic white, but if I do need a little bit of an extra punch. What I like to do is I like to use my acrylic pump marker in white. Now all of these supplies are listed in my description box below. So if you're like Cassie, what is an acrylic pump marker? It's listed down below, but basically it's an acrylic paint pen that has a very bright white. So sometimes the acrylic white uh, can be a little soft and I like to have a very bright pinpoint highlight and I will come in with the marker and do that as well. So either you're going to use titanium white out of the tube for your brightest highlight or you can go ahead and grab one of these markers and do that too. So either way we're just working our way up to the brightest highlight possible and of course anytime you feel you may have gone too much with your highlight you're missing some of that information below you can can just go in and add in any oranges you might like or some yellows to kind of um, make that sort of catch light a little smaller and bring back some more of that eye. 
Now begins the fun part of the painting and the part of the process that will take the longest. Painting fur takes time, patience, and a lot of layers to achieve a realistic looking effect. And I'm going to do my best today to lead you through my process. So to start off, I always go over the black section of the eye area and finalize the structure. A lot of times we end up going over top of some of that black paint when we are painting the eyeball in all of the details. And so I like to ensure that it is rich and opaque before before moving on. Once that has dried, we can start working in our stage one of our fur texture. To begin with our fur, we're going to start with the darker fur and shadows underneath the eye. Now, I always work from back to front, from dark to light, so we're going to start there. I am using my round brushes to complete this step along with a filbert brush for any larger areas of coverage, and I have mixed a darker gray than my original base color. So be sure to take your original base color and add a little bit of Mars Black a bit at a time until you achieve this color. Now we're going to block in all the areas of shadow, hair direction, and texture that we can see and slowly start to layer this under eye area. I think it is important to note that at this stage, we want to make sure we leave some of that original base color to shine through these shadows. Now you can see that I'm being very selective of where I put this color as I do not want to make this area just dark gray. I don't want to cover over that original base color. I want to show that there is depth and levels to this fur with many different shades of gray. And we are going to continue to layer and layer and layer until we hit those top highlights. So every step of the way, I want to make sure that some of the color underneath shines through. While that fur is drying, I want to go ahead and finish off our eye. Now the area surrounding the eye is just as important as the eye itself. It gives the eye a place to rest and it makes it a part of the painting so it's not just floating there without any structure. I'm going to take a mixture of Mars Black and Titanium White to make a charcoal color and start to add this color into the rubbery area surrounding the eye. Now I found my small round brush worked best for this as it allows a lot more control in such a fine space. I will increase the lightness of this gray color with some titanium white as the rubbery area starts to bounce more light and appear more glossy. So a lot of the times in these animal eyes they will have a very glossy area in the inner corner. Um, whether that's moisture or not or just what the material is made out of, it does tend to reflect a lot of light and be a lot brighter. But if you find that you go a little bit too light in some areas and you want to tone it down a little, you can always bring some more black paint over top to correct any wayward lines, make the area darker, or even come in with a Mars Black glaze and just kind of soften the area a little bit depending on the light source. Now we are ready to tackle the next layer of fur on our tiger. So we can go ahead and create an even darker gray color to add in the deepest shadows in this area. So we're only going to add this darker color to very select spots and locations. I'm going to be very cautious not to overwhelm or cover over our previous layer. So you will find that you will use less paint and less of this layer than the previous. While I'm working through with this gray color adding in those shadows, I also dip into black in some areas to bulk up the markings on this tiger. So sometimes at this stage they do get a little lost while we're working through the fur pattern. It's so easy to cover over these markings, kind of have some wayward lines. So I like to be sure at this stage I'm keeping track of their location. I don't want to lose the anatomy or the shape. So I just go in with some Mars Black, cover over all of the markings once more and kind of bulk up their shape and space if needed. Once the shadows are dry, we can go ahead and add some highlight layers on top. With my small round brush, I'm going to mix a lighter version of our original base color. So I'm going to add titanium white to that original base and make it a little bit lighter. We want this to be the lightest layer so far so that it stands out against our dark back layers and is also lighter than our base. This will be the layer that brings the rest to life and allows for this fur to start to take shape. Honestly, it is the best part of this painting painting in my opinion. <laughs> The biggest piece of advice that I can give for this section is that you have to really pay attention to the fur direction. We want to make sure that not all of the lines are going the same way, but we also want to follow the way that the hair grows. Now I know that seems kind of redundant, but I'll try my best to explain. <laughs> it's very easy to paint everything symmetrical, looking neat and tidy. It just looks and feels nice to do, but this can actually make your painting look less realistic and almost fake 
opaque, like very flat against the canvas. So we want to have some lines, the, you know, that go against that feeling and are a little bit wayward and a little bit out there, maybe going the opposite direction to make sure that the fur has a nice curve to it and a very realistic, fluffy looking feeling. We're going to put this highlight in between and on top of all of the other layers, and we're going to have some fun. We want to be a little bit carefree and a little bit creative because we know that if you ever go a little bit too far with this highlight, now everything looks one color, we can go ahead and add in those darker layers once more, or even come in with a little bit of a glaze and kind of soften some things as well. So don't be afraid to just kind of go for it and see what happens. And you know what, you might find that you come up with a really cool lighting source with this as well. There's been a few paintings I've done where all of a sudden I had a very drastically different light source and I went with it in the final painting. So really just have fun at this part and kind of let yourself go a little bit. Be creative. For this next area in the painting, we're going to go ahead and expand the area that we are working in. At this stage, the bottom of that eye section I consider completed. I don't think there's anything else that you really need to work on. So I'm going to go ahead and start to branch out towards the canvas left, which will be the bridge of this tiger's nose. Now we're going to rinse and repeat a lot of these steps throughout this painting, which is a very good thing. It's a lot of practice, but for anyone who's using this voiceover as a guide, hopefully it doesn't get too annoying rinse and repeating as often as I will. <laughs> now with our small brush, and I'm using a little bit larger of a small brush, I don't want to be too, too thin for this. Um, you can use a small or medium filbert as well, whatever you prefer. I'm going to go ahead and mix a darker shadow color than my base. I'm going to start off about 10% darker. I don't want to go too much too soon. And I'm going to follow the textures and patterns that I see in my reference. Now I find the bridge of the nose on tigers is much shorter hair and a lot neater. So I kind of use a little bit of a different technique. I tend to just paint in blocks of color. Um, I kind of follow the shapes that I see of the shadows rather than each individual hair like we did before. And I'm going to go ahead and add in those shadows first and when I feel like I have a good base or good foundation I'm going to bring that 10-20% darker color in over top for those deeper shadows. Now a lot of times you'll notice in your tiger's markings that they have a lot of scratch marks, scars, um, maybe some hair is torn off or hair doesn't grow there anymore so just make sure that we keep track of those as well if there are any on your reference and add those in if necessary. Once those shadow layers have dried, we can go ahead and add in the highlight. So the nose I found to be a little bit on the darker side, not as well lit. So my highlight color is going to be a little bit softer and darker than that initial highlight under the eye area. I'm adding in a touch of Mars black, not a lot, and just making sure that it doesn't stand out too much and doesn't kind of take over the attention from the eyes. I'm taking a small brush and following the direction of the hair that I see in my reference. So we know that the bridge of the nose is very rounded. It is rounding away from us in this photograph. So we want to make sure that the hair also follows this direction and curves upwards. So from the root around the eye, up and over will be the direction that I am painting. It's very important that we really do our best to get that curve and sort of the anatomy and shape correct so that this will help make our painting look 3D and more realistic. You'll see here that I'm kind of going back and forth in a lot of different areas and I'm kind of changing the paint color, adjusting things, maybe adding some more hair. And I like to call this my adjustment phase. So once I have a big section completed, so for example, the under eye area, and now the bridge of the nose is nearing completion, I like to go ahead and adjust everything as a whole. So essentially I'm connecting two pieces of this painting together since I do paint in very weird small sections. Sections. So I want to make sure that they are cohesive and that they match. I would hate to do all of this work on our fur detailing, making a realistic section of the painting and not having one cohesive unit almost would look like a jigsaw puzzle. And I want this to look like a beautiful painting. So we have to make sure that we join the two together. So I'm adding any highlights in between the two sections that I think I may have missed or maybe weren't as effective. Also doing with the shadows as well. So if there's any 
shadows between the two pieces that I may have missed or I think maybe I covered over too much. I am adding them in and glazing at this stage is crucial as well. I kind of wish I glazed a little bit more. Um, I haven't really done anything so far, which is kind of surprising doing this voiceover. So I'd like to do a little bit more glazing. Glazing is perfect to connect these two areas and really just soften up your painting a little bit. Acrylic can be quite defined. I'm sure I'll talk about glazing a little bit more later, but it can be very defined. So using a little bit of a watered down acrylic in Mars Black to soften these areas will definitely help co cohes make them match. Next, we are going to go ahead and start working our way down the painting. Now, the mouth of this tiger in particular is very interesting as the pose is not something you always see in tiger photographs. The tongue is out, the mouth isn't as visible, and this can pose a bit of a challenge. To start off, I have added a bit of an off-white color to the front of the mouth to cover over a little bit of the canvas that was poking through. So when I was doing that initial glaze wash at the very beginning, I must have missed this section, and so I just wanted to make sure it was 100% opaque before we continued. The front of the mouth is typically always this white or sort of cream eggshell color as it gradients towards a darker gray color where the whisker holes are. Now we already have these marked in back from when we did our black outline so we already know a rough idea of where the fur information will go in between these holes. You will want to take a darker gray color and start adding in the shadows around these holes and some of them you may even want to cover over a little bit with a little bit of dark gray paint strokes. Now we want them to be not so perfect and circular so you may have to adjust the shape a little bit or like I said cover over some of them to create a really unique texture. Once that is dry, we can go ahead and start adding in some highlights. So I'm going to take some titanium white with a little bit of Mars black, a very, very light gray, and I'm going to go over top of this area very selectively and start highlighting this tiger's mouth. Now we wanna make sure we keep some of the darker tones underneath and overlap some of those whisker holes to create some depth and dimension to this mouth. We really wanna work on the roundness. A very small brush would work perfectly for this area Area, uh, so that the brush stroke is not too wide and offers too much coverage. We want to be very, very small at this stage. Once you're done highlighting and you're feeling good about the brightness, what I'd like to do now is actually bulk up the area of the whisker holes. So I'm going to go over and make sure that their shape and their size is correct. And a lot of times, just like the stripes, what I was talking about earlier and the markings on this tiger, the whisker holes will do the exact same thing. So the more that we paint and the more layers we add to this painting, um, the whisker holes and the markings tend to get very, very small and diminished looking. So we we want to make sure that these are bold. This is a very black marking on this tiger's face and we want them to stand out amongst all the other details that we are putting into this painting. So once you've completed the whisker holes, we've reinforced that shape. We're going to go in with a very dark charcoal color. So we're using Mars black and a very minimal amount of titanium white. You don't want it black, but you don't want it to be too light either. It's, it's a very, very fine, very precise color. And we're gonna go ahead beside each of these whisker holes and we're going to blend them into the face. So I'm doing light little brush strokes on either side, very, very small, minute. I think at this stage I was working in a triple zero brush, which is very, very fine. And I'm just gonna go ahead and add in those little hair textures. I don't want these whisker holes to look like they are just circles on this face face. And so by adding in these little flares, it tends to just bring those whisker areas into the design a little bit more and makes it look a little bit more realistic. Once that has dried, we are going to go ahead and start adding in some base layers to our tiger's nose and the tongue. Now at this stage, I was super excited to get to this part because up until now it has looked a little bit lackluster and I couldn't really get the feeling of this tiger or the anatomy. So I hope by now in your painting, you are feeling confident and ready to tackle this stage. I promise once this, once this part is completed, you will feel completely different about your painting. So looking at my reference, I'm going to choose a middle 
tone gray, one that I can both highlight and shade with ease for both my tongue and the nose. When I have the base layers completed and I feel confident in the color choice, I'm going to go ahead and start working on the nose details. So to start off, I want to add some depth to the nostril that can be seen on the side of the tiger's face. If we don't, this may just fall flat. It kind of just looks like a void right now. So we need to add a little bit of a gloss and a shine to it. Now I will take a lighter charcoal color to achieve this and I will add in a few paint strokes to the side. So I'm really paying attention to all of the bumps and the ridges that there may be and any sort of glossiness or moisture that I can see and I will go ahead and add that in. Now depending on your light source, whether you're following this reference or working with your own, this glossiness may be more or it may be less. So always just take a look at your reference and paint accordingly. Now the next step in our painting, once you have the sort of depth and effects in that nostril, we're going to go ahead and finish off this nose. So to start off, I'm going in with a little bit of a darker gray now, and I'm going to go ahead and shadow the bottom of the nose. So where the tongue and the nose touch, because there's not a lot of light there, I'm going to have a little bit of a shadow. And then I'm going to have a shadow in the middle of the nose. So that is where the sort of nose comes together. It's kind of curved and then dips down in in the middle. So that is going to be our shaded area for this painting. I was a little bit surprised it wasn't as shadowed as I originally thought when I chose this reference. So again, kind of a little bit of a boring nose today, but that's okay. Maybe your next painting will be a little bit more complex. Um, and then once you're done the shadow, you're just going to go ahead and bring in a lighter gray. So you're going to add in titanium white to your mix and you're going to use your small brush and we're just going to selectively highlight and kind of refine this nose shape a little further. So I've added in the highlights on the left and the right side of the nose. And you can see here I'm being very selective, just kind of refining this shape a little bit further and making sure it looks exactly as I want it to look. The next stage in our painting is going to be to get this tongue painted in in the surrounding area. Now to start off, I'm going to use my small round brush and I'm going to mix three different shades of gray. I'm going to mix a dark gray, a middle tone gray and a lighter gray. And for this area, I ended up actually doing a lot of wet on wet blending. So I'm basically, as the paint is drying, not quite dry, I'm adding in the secondary color on top and basically blending together on the canvas rather than on the palette. And I find that this really helps smooth out the edges and create really nice gradients in certain areas. And I basically did this because the underside of the tongue is very smooth. And so I wanted just to to ensure that I got that look correct. The goal in addition to the smoothness though, is to also make sure that we get the veins and we capture those ridges on the underside of the tongue to really give our viewer that perspective that this tongue is flipping up. Otherwise it might look a little flat or it might just look like a block of different color grays. And we definitely want this to look as though it is scooping up towards that nose. As always, I start from dark to light and I'm adding different variations of gray throughout just to keep it fresh and I played close attention to my reference to make sure that I got all of the details correct and in the correct locations. Once that has dried, we can go ahead and start working on the mouth and the chin. Now to start off, I will begin adding in some texture and depth to the gum line and the sides of the face that extend to the lower chin. So this block of color that's extending downwards. Up until now, this has really just been a block of color and it definitely needs now some love and care to turn it into a tiger's mouth. I have mixed a charcoal color, so a very dark gray, and using my small brush, I'm going in and blocking in all of the lighter areas of this gum line and the side of the mouth that are catching any sort of light. We want this area to have movement, folds, and depth in order to look realistic, so I'm going to make sure that I follow the shape and the size of the teeth. I'm making sure that I have those little bumps blocked in and then the sort of line upwards towards the side of the cheek. Even just a few of these lines right now at this stage in the painting can make a huge difference. So let's go ahead and put those in now. 
Now this stage in the painting is one of the most exciting as it brings the entire face together and this is starting to look more and more like a finished tiger. To start I am using a middle tone gray and my medium sized filbert brush and I'm going to go ahead and block in all of the large chunks of hair that I can see on the chin. Now I find the filberts work wonderfully for illustration of large clumps of hair. The way that these brushes are made and how they are tapered works perfectly. They have a little bit of a thicker base and then come together to a point towards the end of your brush stroke. So I find that they work perfectly. And I always say remember to work smarter not harder. So if you have a little bit of a larger brush that you can use, whether it is square, a dagger, a filbert brush, that would work wonderfully for this section. So I'm going to go in, fill in the entire chin, and you can also see that I kind of extend this color upwards towards the side of the cheek area as well. We're going to get to this section shortly, but I'm basically making it easier on myself that that cheek area will always and always Already have a base layer. I'm just waiting for it to dry essentially, but fill in the entire chin, extend any extra paint you have up the side of the tiger's face, and we'll go ahead and start working on some teeth and some shadows. Now for the teeth, I'm using the smallest brush that I have available. There are some very little tiny baby teeth in the front, so I wanted to make sure that I got those shaped correctly. And essentially I'm using the middle tone gray that I used for the chin area, and I'm just going ahead and filling in these five teeth. Now once the sort of base layer has dried, again, you can choose as light or as dark as you want. I'm going to go ahead and start adding in the highlights. So I'm being very selective. I don't want these teeth to be white, white, in the wild, these are more of a yellowish tone. So when converted to black and white, they are more of a sort of middle gray. I'm just adding in a little bit of a highlight to differentiate the teeth from one another. And then once I'm done that, I go in with a darker gray, not quite as dark as the gum line, but I'm going in with a darker gray to separate them a little bit. So this tiger had a little bit more spacing um, in between the front teeth. So I went ahead and, and blocked that in. And then a little bit of a sort of glaze on the sort of canvas right hand side of that big canine tooth. I added in a little bit of a glaze there to kind of darken it and soften it a little bit further. Now you will want to extend some of that sort of, I'll call them lips, uh, that little lip there beside the tongue and the tooth. You're going to want to add a little bit of paint strokes over top so that it looks like that tooth is sitting underneath. We want to make sure it doesn't look like it's getting caught on that lip. We want it to be under. Now the next step is we're going to take our small detailer brush and I'm mixing a darker gray tone. You can see it's very similar to that gum line gray. And I'm going to go ahead and add in the darkest markings in this chin area. Now you'll notice on big cats, a lot of times by that gum line, they almost have that black color extending into the chin and very sparse sort of white or cream hair. So I'm just going in, adding in those dark markings and you can see I'm kind of flopping back and forth between my face Filbert and my small round. And the reason being is if any areas I think need to be a little bit wider, a little bit thicker, I'm switching to that filbert just to save my hands some time and some work. And then for the finer areas, I'm going in and using the small detailer. So I always say use whatever brush you prefer, but again, thicker areas, just so much easier to use a bit of a larger brush. Now you can see I've added in a little bit of titanium white to that dark gray. So I've softened this up quite a bit and I'm just going ahead and adding in what I like to call kind of like the lighter shadow. So not the darkest area, but a little bit of a lighter shadow. And this usually happens towards the bottom of the tiger's chin before those really long white hairs. They do have a little bit of a softer gray. So I'm going ahead and adding that in. And even to where the chin meets the neck, I've added in that light gray there as well. So I always say add in these uh, sort of shades to taste matching your reference and watching your light source. Now the next step in our painting, once those layers have dried, make sure they're dry, we can go ahead now and start adding in those highlights. Now I use three different brushes usually for the highlighting of the chin. I will start with the filbert brush to get the larger chunks put in. I will go ahead and use the small round brush for a little bit more detailing. And then I will finish off using my liner brush. Now I've added in titanium white to my original color mixture. So it's much lighter and I'm just 
going ahead and lightly blocking in where these highlights will go, making sure that I leave a lot of the darker shadow and the middle shadow to kind of shine through. So just as we've been doing this entire time with our fur, making sure we don't cover over everything. And this is especially true with this dark shadow area. You can see here that I'm being very selective of where I put these highlights. Um, it's very sparse. A lot of times there's not a lot of hair there. So I'm just being sure to have a very sort of sparse sort of highlighted area and then get much more full towards the bottom of the chin. Now, lastly, once that has all dried and you're liking the look of the highlights and the placement, what I like to do next is I like to go ahead and use my liner brush and get those really long sort of straggly stray hairs. Now, Typically for this area, I will use my titanium white straight out of the tube, but what I will do is I will water it down just a touch. So sometimes the paint is a little bit too opaque and a little bit too thick, and it doesn't always create the nice fine lines that I'm looking for. So I always find by having a really wet brush or adding a little bit of water to the titanium white mixture really does help with getting these long whisker lines or long sort of straggly chin hair. So I'm making sure that I am doing all sorts of different directions, different sort of thicknesses, and really just by adding these in, you can already see this makes a huge difference and really brings this chin to life. So continue to highlight until you feel as though the chin is light enough and make sure you really add in a lot of these sporadic kind of crazy chin hairs. We interrupt today's art lesson with a word from our sponsors. A big shout out to Chartpack, Grumbacker, and Molotov for sponsoring today's video, as well as sponsoring all of my content here on YouTube. Their links can be found in the description box below, as well as places to purchase their products for your own art toolkit. Thank you so much again for your support, Chartpack, and let's get back to today's lesson. Typically when I am painting, I will do this step last, but today I wanted to jump right in and get it completed. The whiskers on a big cat portrait are some of the most important information we can paint. They give the painting life and realism, and honestly, once you get the hang of it, they are truly fun to paint. I know some of you may not believe me, but once you get the hang of it and kind of have a system down and what works for you, they really are a lot of fun. To get started, I use two different tools to create my my whiskers, a liner brush and a Molotol acrylic pump marker in white. I will use both of these interchangeably depending on the thickness and the type of whisker or essentially even the pose that the big cat is in. I am using titanium white and I've added in water to thin my paint down. Now I want it to be a little bit on the thinner side, but I don't want it to be quite at the level of a glaze or a wash. I do want to still have some nice body to this paint. I chose an area to start at the base of the whisker on the left and the right hand side by the whisker holes. And when I'm ready and feeling confident, I slowly move my hand across the canvas with a fully loaded brush working outwards. Now it's important to remember the direction and to have these whiskers looking pretty spontaneous. They are not perfect. Uh, and a lot of times they are at many different angles. So be sure to switch it up when you paint. So you're going to have some going upwards, some going straight out, and then some curving down words as well. I usually bring my acrylic pump marker into play when the whiskers are thicker, maybe a little bit more opaque, to make sure that I get a nice smooth line that I can actually thicken up myself much easier than if I was using a brush. So I could go over it two, three times to ensure the opaqueness. If you don't have a steady hand or maybe you find whiskers difficult, I definitely encourage you to try the acrylic pump markers. I find that they might make it a lot easier as they do feel more similar to to a ballpoint pen or even a pencil. So might, maybe this will work better for you, but either way, a thin liner brush or a dagger brush or the pump markers will do this job just fine. For this next step in the painting, we're going to go ahead and work our way up towards the eyebrow and the top of this tiger's head. Now, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of these steps are rinse and repeat. So we're going to follow the exact same steps we did for the cheek of the tiger and the bridge of the nose. So as a little refresher, we're going to go ahead and start with the darkest shadows. So you're going to find all of these deep dark shadows and skin folds and fur folds within the top of this tiger's head and block those in. Now, 
Now, depending on how much of a base layer you put in, we may want to go ahead and bulk up these black markings as well. So be sure to have some Mars black on your palette so that you can go ahead and adjust the size and shape of these markings. Once you have that completed, we can go ahead and add in some highlights. So you're going to go with a much lighter gray, adding titanium white, and use a small brush to go ahead and block in the highlights. Now, depending on your light source, the top of the tiger's head may be very well lit, but it might not be. So if your subject is more backlit or maybe underneath, of course, your light source is going to change the amount of highlights you have. For the ears of our tiger, we're going to go ahead and mix two colors. The interior of the ear will be a lighter gray and the exterior will be a darker one by about 20%. We can go ahead with the small filbert brush and get these base layers done and out of the way. Once they are dry, we are going to use a smaller brush. So I'm using my small round and I'm going to start blocking in the darkest layers of hair that we can see on both the inside of the ear and the outside. Depending on your light source and the amount of hair that is visible in your reference, these shadows may change. So be sure to check your reference. For my tiger today, that back ear wasn't too shadowed. So a little bit of shadow will do just fine. I don't want to go too heavy on this. Once I feel good about the placement, I'm going to go ahead and take my small round brush or my liner would work well for this as well and get those really fuzzy long ear hairs done. They will sprout from the root by the middle of the tiger's head outward in many different directions. So some of them are going to be clumped together in large groups. Some of them are going to be a little wayward and much more thin, very reminiscent to our whisker painting. I want to make sure that I also include varying levels of highlight throughout to keep this area from falling flat and just looking a little bit blah. I want this to really stand out. This white should be very, very white. And if you don't feel you can get that white enough, you can go ahead and add in your pump marker on top. Remember, those are very opaque and add in a few hairs that way as well. With the ear on the canvas right, this reference was much more full of hair. However, the ear also on this side has a big cavern we need to make sure stays illustrated in our painting. Now to do this, I'm going to go around the edges and paint the white hairs in first with either my small round or my liner brush. But I'm going to make sure that I leave the middle to be painted with darker gray hairs instead to indicate that those hairs are further back in the painting. So the middle hairs are not catching as much light. They are not as light or white. And then the outside is the stuff that we can see and that is exterior on the ear. So while that section of the ear is drying, I'm going to go ahead and work on the side of the face. Now, admittedly, at this point in the painting, I was really back and forth between a lot of different sections, and I tend to make my life much more difficult trying to do these voiceovers. So I'm going to do my best to follow along to my own painting. <laughs> And I'm sorry in advance if I'm really bouncing around a lot. So what I'm going to do while that ear is drying is I'm going to go ahead and work on the side of the face and really start to prep this next area, which is down the side towards the neck. Now I'm starting with a very light gray. Keep in mind, this is going to be the whitest section of the painting. So really our shadow colors aren't much of a shadow color at all. So I'm using a very sort of light gray, if you will, and I'm going in and blocking in the darkest areas of the side of the face that I can see. Now, these are very sporadic. Typically around those dark markings is where I found the shadows to be the most, or if there were any sort of two chunks of hair that were sort of folded over one another because they do get quite long here on a tiger, then I would go ahead and block that in. But I'm really not doing too, too much. And if it weren't for this really zoomed in camera, it probably would not look like I was painting anything at all. So be very careful in this section as we're starting to prep not to shadow too much. Otherwise, you might end up with some extra stripes on this tiger. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to add in a little bit of a slight glaze to the interior cavernous area of this ear. So I obviously felt that the center of the ear was a little bit too defined. I wanted this to be much softer. So by adding in a little bit of a glaze with some water to your Mars black paint, I'm using a blender brush is a really great way to kind of soften this interior area. Now using titanium white, I'm fairly certain this was straight out of the tube, just plain white. 
I'm going in with my liner brush and I'm just working in the utmost highlights in this ear. Now you can see here that I'm doing some very quick paint strokes for the short stubby hairs down towards where the ear is ending. And then I am dragging my brush stroke, making really long fine strokes towards the center. And it took me a long time to not paint all of these hairs in one direction. I still find myself sometimes catching myself doing this. So I know I've probably said this a billion times in all of my videos, but just be sure that your hairs are moving in different directions. Otherwise this hair is going to look too perfect. So look at your reference, digest what direction the hair is going, and then really start one hair at a time. And that's exactly how I do this. I look at one hair, move to another, look at that hair, move to another. Okay. What is overlapping? What is on the side? What is underneath? And really just build the ear from there. I think it's something to keep in mind as well that with that interior sort of cavernous area where we put the glaze, I also did add in a little bit of a lighter gray. And the reason why, and I kind of added back to it is because I wanted this cavernous area to blend in with those white highlights. I didn't want them to look like two pieces, very two separate puzzle pieces of this ear. I wanted them to be one unit. So by adding in this lighter gray, it kind of works as a gradient to those highlights. And really layering with acrylic and kind of painting fur in general is just a big game of back and forth. You are adding in shadows, highlights, middle tones, glazes until you get to the achieved look that you're wanting. So just keep that in mind. This next stage in the painting always looks so confusing, but is honestly one of the most fun, relaxing parts of the process. The whole entire face and the part we connect with as viewers is now completed, and the rest of the painting can honestly be experiments and enjoyment. We're going to go ahead and work on the cheek and the neck area as we near the end of this tiger painting already. To start, I'm going to work on finalizing some of the shadow areas around the chin and the side of the cheek. Where the markings get close together and folded, you will see there is much more shadow there and darker hair to be seen. Now, I typically will use a middle tone gray or a charcoal color, depending on the lighting, and a liner brush to achieve the look that I'm going for. From there, I will bounce back and forth between two colors. That's it, two. I'm going to have my Mars black and my titanium white prepped and ready on my palette. I like to, at this stage, refine the markings I have drawn on with my liner brush to make them look a little bit more fluffy and real. Up until this point, they were just drawn in with a filbert brush, so they might be a little bit too thick and not as refined. Light paint flicks and longer brush strokes will help you achieve both short and long fluffy strands. And we're going to do the exact same technique with the titanium white on top, but instead this is going to be for the light white fluff on the side of the tiger's face. We want to make sure that we extend these light fluffy hairs over top of some of our markings as well, so that the markings look like they are a part of this tiger and not just painted on and looking flat. Now you'll notice as we start to move away from this tiger's face down towards the cheek, neck, and shoulder area that the hair on this tiger actually gets a lot thicker and a lot longer. And my remedy for this is to use my filbert brush, but in a much larger size. So again, my filberts coming in clutch, my absolute favorite brushes. I'm just going with my filbert in titanium white and blocking in a lot of these sort of thick, longer white hairs. So I'm just clumping these in, paying attention to the clumps and not the fine thin hairs to really get the effect that I'm looking for. And this is one of the reasons why I have both Mars Black and Titanium White mixed on my palette ready to go is that I want to use these interchangeably. So I'm putting down thick white brush strokes for the sort of large cheek hairs and then right over top where there are markings, I'm adding in some black hairs over top of the freshly painted white ones. I want to make sure that all of these markings are integrated and that they look seamless and as one, one piece, and that they kind of flow together quite nicely because these markings on a tiger don't just start and stop. They actually are kind of integrated into these hairs. The longer they are, they're woven in together, they're overlapping. So I wanna make sure that I get that effect included in my painting as well. 
So the last few steps in this painting are really going to involve the back of the ear and the neck area. So I'm taking here my liner brush and my small round, and I'm just going ahead and blocking in some more of these dark shadows behind this tiger's ear. So I'm taking this darker color down off the side, and I'm just really working on getting this shape correct. I want it to be a little bit more round and sort of kind of jutting out. You can see here that the tiger's ear kind of comes out towards the right hand side of the canvas and I wanted to make sure that I got this roundness correct. Now you can see I'm also kind of bouncing back and forth between two different areas. I'm adding in some of the darker shadows towards the sort of bottom of this cheek fur and then kind of in towards the back of the neck, kind of where the head joins to the neck area. And I want this to be a little bit more shadowed and not as light. So this is really a giant adjustment phase. At this stage, like I mentioned, the most important areas are done already and this is really just making sure that I get the remainder of the portrait to match. Now you can see here that again, mentioning those really long sort of neck hairs, I've transitioned to using my filbert brush for the base chunky layers. I want those to be really quite thick. And then I'm coming in over top with my liner brush and my small round to kind of refine those areas a little bit further. And at this stage, I always recommend having more than one gray mixed on your palette. So you're going to want to have two, three, four different middle tone grays so that you can kind of transition back and forth between and kind of create some variation in your portrait. Now, it is important to keep in mind that this back section of the painting is going to be a lot darker than the front and the cheek side of this tiger. All of our highlights and our middle tone colors are going to be naturally darker as the sun or light source is not hitting this area as much. And I wanted to reinforce the idea that this tiger is emerging from the darkness. So that was my sort of artistic flair that I was adding to this painting was to have the tiger sort of emerging from the dark and into the light. Just as we did before, I'm going to start with my dark shadow as a guide and mark in all of the areas of the dark markings and lack of lighting that I can see. This is especially true behind the ears and the sort of connection of the ear to the neck as well. Because the fur on the tiger is much coarser towards this area, I'm using my medium or large filbert to create these chunks. And as we move down the portrait, reinforce the shape and size of these chest markings. Now, the chest markings themselves are very interesting because they are kind of a strange shape. They're very long, sometimes hidden, only to sort of emerge again. So you may want to use a very tapered end of your brush to achieve this thin stroke. Or if you have a liner brush available, this would work just fine. However, I do find that the liner brush can almost be too defined sometimes. So you might want a brush that maybe is a little bit on the sort of older side or damaged side to get that sort of fluffiness, if you will. When you feel like you have a good base for your shadows, we're going to do the exact same techniques, but reverse it for the highlight. So we want to make sure that we are painting in all different directions with our larger brush to create nice big chunks of fur on the neck and the chest. I always say that honestly, the crazier, the better. We can always tone it down later. If you find that you do go too light, you can always bring back the darkness with a glaze um, instead of remixing an entirely new color. So rather than having to go back to your palette, work on your color mixing, you can just go in with a glaze instead. I definitely recommend, speaking of glazes, that at the end of your portraits, before you call it finished, I definitely would go ahead and glaze any areas that you think may need to be softened. Acrylic can be really defined and really kind of sharp, so I always find that the glazing adds a nice softer, less sharp fur texture. You can also glaze things like eyes, so if you feel like the eyes did not get dark enough, if the catchlight is too bright, or whatever else you feel may have gotten lost while you are painting, take a step back. Maybe you hang this portrait on the wall or if you're working on an easel, take a full step back, maybe even leave the room for a little while, come back and see what areas may need a little bit more of extra attention. But just remember to add a lot of water to your glaze and dab off any extra from your brush. We don't want it too runny, but we also don't want to come in with a very sort of opaque paint. Trust me, I've done it. I thought my glaze was much thinner than it actually was and boom, I put some opaque paint right over top of my texture. So just keep that in mind. 
If you liked today's tutorial, I really would love, and I'm going to start to try to do this more often, but I would really love to have your feedback. I am always looking at adding new things to my paintings, whether it's a new subject in general, something that I haven't covered yet, a specific animal, or maybe throughout the tutorial, there was a section that you really loved that really helped you. I would love to hear about it. So if you have a moment, please in the comments, let me know your favorite part of today's tutorial and maybe an animal or subject that you would like me to cover. YouTube is still very new for me. I am learning, so I am always open to this and am so, so grateful for when I do hear from you and we continue to grow this community. It has been so exciting and I just can't wait to make more videos for you guys. So thank you so, so much once again. All right, and there you have it. There is our finished black and white tiger painting. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Thank you so much for watching. But if you're not quite done and you wanna learn some more, here is my in-depth guide on how to paint a lion in acrylics.